Uh, let's go to Vienna. Anton uh, Shekovstov is director of the Center for Democratic Integrity, the author of Russia and the Western Far Right. Thank you for being with us here on France 24. Good evening, and thank you for having me. Uh, I, I want to ask you about uh, uh, remarks you made for, uh, for um, an investigative report that uh, was posted on our website, France24.com. But before I do, just reaction to what you've been listing there with, with Robert Parsons here in the studio, and that is when Vladimir Putin is speaking in his State of the Nation address, how high on his mind is Alexei Navalny? Well, I, I do agree that um, there is a lot of envy on, uh, on Putin's part concerning Navalny. He, he is envious of the popularity that Navalny has. And also there is another thing. Uh, Putin, he is a very old man. And I think much of what he is doing now, he is now trying to secure his place in Russia's history. And I think he is, internally, probably he is even fighting with Navalny for for the legacy, for the memory, how he will be remembered in um, in Russia's textbooks, in future Russian textbooks. So there is also this, uh, you know, this um, um, this salience, mortality, mortality salience, which is on Putin's mind, and uh, the death of Navalny probably even somehow sped up um, his thoughts about his his own legacy. Now, we talked earlier about the remarks concerning uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, uh, what he had said at the beginning of the week. Uh, the French accused at times over the last two years by the Ukrainians of being laggers when it comes to uh, uh, talking tough to Moscow. No longer the case after uh, Monday he said in response to a reporter's question that, yeah, one of the options could be to send Western troops uh, to Ukraine. How much of that do you think has to do, and this gets to what is in that investigative report we were talking about, the fact that uh, Russian meddling uh, has directly targeted France? You know, uh, this has been going on for, for years now, this Russian meddling, this Russian interference. And uh, fortunately, although uh, Ukrainians and uh, you know, Russia watchers such as myself have been warning for years now that what, what Russia is doing concerning the West, this interference, is not just interference, it's not just, uh, you know, some, some meddling. The Kremlin believes that it is already at war with the West, especially with the recent, um, with more recent uh, statements by Vladimir Putin when he tries to present his war against Ukraine as part of a larger war between Russia and the West, between yeah, but, the but East can you, can and the you... West. But you, as you say, I mean, you go back to the 2016 election in the U.S., where you see the way uh, there's evidence of uh, uh, the, the Russians trying to interfere in the 2017 election uh, of Emmanuel Macron in favor of his rival. That Troll farms, they've existed for years. They've existed for years, and they're continuing to exist. And I think now Russia is even more active actively trying to interfere in the election process. And if previously, for example, it, it would only try to interfere in those countries that it felt like, you know, the main drivers of the European Union, which is France and Germany, well, the UK before Brexit. But now it tries to interfere almost everywhere where it can interfere. So it's a, it's a larger front now. And it's using these uh, social design agency and structura agencies and some other professional organizations to interfere with European politics. The, so, the, social, the brought, social design agency, uh, which in the piece you're quoted as saying, is uh, the, the inheritor of uh, that internet research agency that Yevgeny Prigozhin had. Uh, indeed. Well, the, this place, this throne uh, of Prigozhin and his, uh, his own structures is now empty, you know. And uh, now several organizations, I think, uh, they're competing for the same place because this is important. This is a lot of money. Yeah, this is not, this is not even political. This is a lot of money. And uh, Social Design Agency is one of the uh, main competitors in this field. Uh, in terms of interfering in the uh, political processes in the West, uh, but also inside Russia. They are also very active inside Russia. 
active inside Russia. So at the heart of it, uh, there's, and just like with uh, the, the troll farm of the past, the Internet Research Agency, uh, for years we didn't see many images of Yevgeny Prigozhin. He wasn't a high-profile figure until the end. Uh, in, in, the, in the piece, they talk about a man by the name of Ilya uh, Gambashidze. Some even doubted his very I I existence because he's not been seen much. Uh, wh 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 what can you tell us about him? Is he real? How important is he? Yes, uh, well, Ilyam Gambashidze is indeed real. Uh, he, he is a political consultant. He is a political technologist, as they call that uh, in Russia. He is the man who manages a company that provides information support for uh, Russian politicians, for even Russia, uh, Ukrainian pro-Russian politicians. And he's also managing uh, various campaigns in the West. So he's a manager. You know, he's not of a, an ideolo uh, ideologue. You know, Prigozhin was a bit of an ideologue. He had some. He had some. He had his own worldview. Gambashidze is a manager. He is a person without real ideology, but uh, he is an administrator. He can uh, he can you know manage different teams working on different issues. So this is what he does. And he carries out what's called doppelganger operations. What are those? Uh, the doppelganger operation, doppelganger is from German. Uh, it's a, it's a, a double, it's a ghost. Uh, the doppelganger operation consisted of a series of uh, small operations that aimed at impersonating websites of established news organizations, such as Le Monde, uh, BBC, The Guardian, uh, Die Welt uh, in German and producing disinformation uh, run through those fake, uh, false uh, websites impersonating uh, established news agencies. And they would spread so-called black propaganda. Black propaganda is when the source of the information is false. It is presented in a, in a false way. So um, they tried to uh, spread this information uh, about Ukraine, about the relations between Russia and the West, Russia and the European Union, uh, producing all kinds of, of disinfo and propaganda. Uh, Anton, uh, Robert Parsons here. If I could just put one question to you, just changing the angle a little bit. Uh, you know, I was saying earlier on that the vast majority of Putin's speech today was on domestic policy rather than international affairs. And presumably this is against the backdrop, at least primarily, uh, of the forthcoming elections. But you know, why does he even care? You know, th this is a man who's guaranteed uh, to sweep the floor in this election. Why does he waste his breath talking about the same old reforms, you know, his concern about demographics, you know, his, his concern about alcoholism, you know, infrastructure and all those things. Uh, you know, he's going to win anyway. Why bother? As far as I understand, uh, the uh, public opinion polls, which are not public, uh, what they're doing, or focus groups say that the Russian population is quite tired of the war. Uh, they do feel that this in, the, the situation that Russia finds itself in is abnormal. So this is not normal. And uh, it was the advice given uh, to Putin by his advisors is that you have to somehow, you know, present what is going on as a, as a normality, that we are winning. There is, there is no catastrophe. There is no national catastrophe, although there is a national catastrophe, even for Russians themselves in Russia, not only for Ukrainians, although on a different scale. So Putin needs to talk about reforms inside the country, saying that, you know, we are not in the uh, apocalypse or something, you know, uh, to try to calm people down uh, because the war, you know, already in its third year now, it is producing a quite a devastating effect. And people, however, they are fooled by the domestic Russian propaganda. They feel that something is really, really wrong going on. And Putin's role now is to normalize the situation, hence such a focus on domestic issues. Yeah, and that Robert's question begs another one, which is uh, you've talked about... Uh, uh, all the means of uh, uh, of winning the information war domestically, both through state media and through people like uh, Ilya Gambashidze. What about the other side? Since 2022, uh, supporters of Navalny, how much has there, is their message resonating? Or in most parts of the country, do people even know that there's a funeral on Friday? 
Well, I'm sure that uh, the Russian population is well aware of, of the developments around Navalny. And, of course, the, uh, the, the team, Navalny's team, was very active in promoting uh, their messages. Uh, the problem, I believe, is not that much uh, that somehow the Russian population doesn't know about uh, Navalny. Well, they do know. Is that they prefer to believe the lies of the Russian official propaganda. There was a research uh, several months ago showing very interestingly that people in Russia, they distrust both the Russian state media and the independent media, but they prefer to listen to still the Russian state media because they produce a very nice picture of what is going on in Russia. They, they choose to believe the lies that they like rather than the lies that they don't like. Uh, Anton uh, Shekatov, uh, uh, I want to thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, from Vienna. I want to thank, thank as well our chief international affairs editor, Robert uh, Parsons.